This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall podcast. You know, Matthias, it's funny. Sometimes people write me and say, Stefan, why don't you change the intro? It's, it's getting old. Players are not as actual anymore. But um, I don't know about you, but if Dortmund re-signed Shinji Kagawa soon as, I don't know, video scout, who knows, <laughs> then <laughs> it will be very uh, up-to-date because uh, Shinji Kagawa is not back, but Nuri Shine is, along with Sven Bender. Jaden Sancho today was announced on a six-month loan deal. So, plenty to discuss today, Matthias. Welcome to the show. And Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah, Happy New Year to you and all the listeners as well. And like I just said before we hit record, what is old is new again. And um, it's funny, whenever old players come back to a club, you know, Kika always does like those slideshows. Like, these are 20 other players that have come, left and came back, and, and they did that with Dalton, and you had people in there like Philip Laux, you know, players that I actually forgot ever, ever played two minutes for the club. But then, you know, you had Kagawa, you know, you had Nuri Shahin, and Annie Möller, and, and Jörg Heinrich, so there, there are some good ones in there. Um, Jürgen Wegmann, Ziggy Held, I mean, those, those are a few. And uh, I hope that Jaden Sancho is maybe a little more Animola in his second stint rather than Shinji Kagawa, whose second stint was a little bit forgettable. But uh, it's good to have him back. I, we've got a lot to talk about there. Yeah, although I, I want to say that Kagawa's stint wasn't, wasn't like terrible either. You know, it just was never. No, back. but it wasn't like the first time. You know, yeah. I mean, you can you can make the argument Animala, his second stint was significantly better than his first stint uh, because also Dortmund won two Bundesliga titles in the Champions League. So, yeah. you know, it's uh, hard to argue against that. But uh, Kaga Kag wasn't bad. You know, it's kind of like Mario Götze. It was OK, but it wasn't like it used to be. Yeah, that's very much true. Um, but uh, yeah, things in general won't be like they used to be because uh, Hans Jochen Watzke, in our time of the show, um, also announced that we he will not extend his contract uh, that runs out in 2025, and he wants to um, be relieved of all sporting responsibility uh, this year by June or July. Um, so good luck with that, first of all. But um, obviously. Um, that is a news that is probably way more profound and important for Borussia Dortmund than whether Jaden Sancho and Ian Martin join Dortmund for uh, a six-month period now or however many months it is for the second half of the season. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as far as defining who this club is and, and, and how they got here and stuff like that, I mean, Aki Vatska is is huge. Um, he obviously deserves his retirement. He's earned it. Um, and he tried to do it once and was kind of, you know, the report said he was persuaded to stay. I think he also still kind of wanted to. Um, but, I mean, he technically wanted to leave already, was it two, three years ago? I think uh, he go, said he wanted to, to exit in 2022. Yeah. Okay, so two years ago. Now. Yeah. Um, and, and when he does finally exit, I mean, he'll be 66 at that point. Um, and you know, you look at quote unquote, regular retirement age, whatever that means these days, um, unless you're a coach <laughs> is 65 and, you know, he's done a lot. He's been in a leaning role at some way at the club now for over at that point, it'll have been just about 25 years, just under he started um, in 2001 as the treasury secretary at the club, which is interesting given that right shortly after that, the club completely imploded financially. 
um, but he was also instrumental with Dr. Rana Roba, who I think too many people forget about um, in saving Borussia Dortmund. And Roba actually was the second time he saved the club. He did that already previously in the 80s or 70s. And so uh, he was important in defining the direction of the club. He was important in taking a risk on a young coach who had just been relegated with a side by the name of Jürgen Klopp. And so, you know, Borussia Dortmund wouldn't exist really much anymore without him and definitely wouldn't have gotten to the success that they had and the status that they've re-earned um, without him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, look where we are now, <laughs> uh, where he was talking about how people take the second place for granted when uh, uh, you and I, Matthias, uh, very well know that uh, this is something that uh, you cannot take for granted whatsoever just because uh, Dortmund have been mediocre and uh, life-threatened for so many times that, uh, yeah... I mean, in sport, nothing can be taken for granted anyway. I mean, uh, that's what I thought. Going into the uh, last match day against Mainz, that Dortmund would definitely win this game. And yeah, they did not. And so uh, problems arose uh, out of that because Dortmund did fall into a hole. But um, yeah, Watzke, I think, um, wanted to leave a little bit earlier. And I feel like a lot of people want um, him to or wanted him to, to leave um quite soonish because it, it, it feels like times have overtaken him, if that makes sense. Um, but that being said, finding a capable replacement for Dortmund will, I think, be the most important thing for the next 10, 20 years um, because this will definitely not be an easy task to do. And he, of course, has been tasked to uh, sort of develop a strategy that goes beyond him. I think... Overall, um, at this press conference that he had, he, he talked about the importance of not making the mistakes of the past, saying that obviously we Dortmund do not want to have an investor, which then means that Dortmund will have to uh, deal with resources they have very carefully. And the mistakes of the past being is that you spend way more money um, that you, than you actually earn and thus create a, a massive debt. Dortmund currently, as far as I know, are debt-free, Matthias, uh, even though the um, the COVID years basically created a 150 million euro hole or something like this. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, really interesting to see how the club will uh, transition as uh, this year and the next year progresses because... Um, it is obviously a chance for positive change, but we all know, Matthias, it is not a guarantee that Dortmund will actually improve post Watzke and uh, might fall in a bigger hole because uh, a fall from grace for a club like Dortmund is something that can happen. Uh, we've seen it with Hamburg, we've seen it with Schalke, um, that uh, you can very easily be thrown off a pedestal and... Uh, now that the Champions League is even more lucrative, um, if you lose out on that frequently, um, it will be very hard to recover from. And obviously there are more teams in the league now that have um, less financial risk, say Leipzig or Leverkusen, if they make errors in their recruitment or so, they can always very easily, or even Wolfsburg can always very easily uh, counter that by, by putting in some fresh cash. And uh, that is pretty much uh, uh, a luxury that Dortmund do not possess. So it is really hard um, going up against uh, the teams around you. But that being said, um, Dortmund, I think, are still the second richest team. And uh, the expectation for right now is that uh, that should reflect in the or on the football field in, in one way or another. Um, Matthias, but I think overall... It needs to be said that uh, every Dortmund fan should be very grateful for what Watzke did in the 25 years almost at the helm, right? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, anything beyond gratitude is uh, baffling for me. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't be the first time I'm baffled by fans. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of 
Johnny come lately, Dortmund fans don't even understand what the club went through in the last 20 years um, and how how important Aki Vatska was. Um, you know, I see a lot of people now with profiles that call themselves Dortmund fans, and in the profile, you know, they have, like, Vatska, Ki, Tezic, Zama out, and it's like, you know, I, I don't like that. I find that classless, but, you know, it's social media. I don't think that's the place to look for class. No. So, um, no, I, I, he'll be missed. He's definitely earned his retirement, and I, I too, will be curious to see where Dortmund go here. There are some extremely capable people in the Bundesliga at the higher echelons in club management. I'm looking specifically at the club, positioned three points and one table spot behind Dortmund. Is that Frankfurt? In, Krusche? In Ein, yep, in Eintracht Frankfurt. They've made some very interesting deals even now in the winter transfer window. And overall, that is a club that was, you know, they weren't next to financial ruin. They were near that, but they were in the Zweite Bundesliga, and they've really rebuilt. Um, and in a very healthy, methodical manner. And so that is that is one that if I were Borussia Dortmund, I would really, really keep an eye on. Um, I think clubs below that don't make sense, to be perfectly honest. Um, Stuttgart, I think if you look above Dortmund in the table, obviously Bayern are out of it. Leipzig, we don't have to talk about. Leverkusen are in an odd position. I think this is a, 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 a one, well, maybe not a one season wonder, given that uh, Alonso probably is not going to Real Madrid after the season, given that Ancelotti extended his contract. But with Stuttgart, eh, gotta wait and see if it's more than this one season. And they also have the Porsche money now. Uh, whereas with Frankfurt, that's a different, different, um, you know, case to to take a close look at. Um, and, and even maybe a club like Augsburg, see, I mean, they're still here uh, and with significantly less uh, at their disposal. So I don't but, know if that translates to Dortmund, though, if I'm... That's true. I think, I think Krusche at Frankfurt makes the most sense um, because Frankfurt has a very passionate fan base. It's a major city. It has a lot of pressure on the club to succeed given its past. I mean, it won the Europa League just two years ago. Um, and so that there there are certain parallels there. And, and that would be, you know, when you look at a big club, because you'd want someone that has been at a big club and performed in building a club in a healthy manner. It's probably the best example right now, because I think Stuttgart's a little too early to tell. Yeah, for sure. And Stuttgart is a, a club in in turmoil also quite throughout the, the recent years. So I feel like one season of or half season of success, if we are honest, uh, should not put them on the top of anyone's list to be honest uh, because as we say the blind chicken <laughs> occasionally also finds a seat <laughs> poorly translated German idioms but uh, blind squirrel finds a nut yes that, that's there you go <laughs> but uh, yeah I, I don't know I don't I don't think uh, for Pischukat uh, um a great example of uh, amazing management. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to be a bit more in the observer role because, honestly, I do not have the expertise to assess who is going to be uh, a, a great candidate uh, to re replace Hans-Joachim Batzko. Obviously, um, Tres and Kramer, who are now the Treasury Secretary, and I don't, I'm not quite sure what Carsten Kramer does, Exactly, I know he is, he is basically uh, the head of marketing or whatever, um, but I don't know what his current role is. I probably should have looked this up. Um, they will probably play a significant role in, in, in taking over um, the more operative parts um, that Watzke is uh, in, involved in. But that being said, I think that um, it's, it's too soon to tell because Hans-Joachim Watzke himself did not have many answers 
on how things would go forward because the uh, the board basically asked him to uh, develop a, a strategy paper, if you will, uh, on and and to think through different scenarios of how his his uh, role can be uh, not only succeeded but maybe uh, restructured, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, obviously uh, it will be a very uh, big uh, storyline for Dortmund uh, replacing Watzke, but uh, that all being said, the short term is not less important because uh, the Champions League next season will have a new modus and with that uh, there is way more prize money on the line. So Champions League qualification this season matters I would say even a little bit more uh, than in previous seasons now, uh, Dortmund, due to their sheer footballing incompetence, have uh, only one win out of their last eight games in the league uh, to show four, which means they are already six points off the top four. Now, obviously, um, if things go well, fifth place might be enough uh, to qualify for that Champions League, which obviously would be a, a huge break for the Black and Yellows. Um, but that being said, you just mentioned Frankfurt, they are only 24 points off Dortmund, so are Hoffenheim and Freiburg, and I've not really watched the winter break friendlies, but if that's anything to go by, uh, Dortmund <laughs> will not anytime soon have a massive turnaround uh, to play much better football. Now, um, that being said, I'm not quite sure where I want to go first, uh, player personnel or coaching staff. I think we're going to go coaching staff. Um, Makes the most narrative sense. Yeah. We're, we're like working down from executive suite to coaching bench <laughs> to on the pitch. Exactly. So uh, according to the club, it was Tetris's idea to hire Nuri Shahin from Antalya Spor and Sven Bender from, I think, uh, the German... FA under 17. Under nine, 19 or 17. Yeah, I think somewhere 17. There. Um, yeah. Uh, to uh, pluck them into his assistant coaching uh, jobs while I mean Reuters Hahn, I'm not entirely sure if he himself quit, if it was sort of an amical decision or Dortmund just wanted him out the door and communicated, communicated it nicely. Not quite sure how, but uh, Reuters Hahn uh, definitely is out. And so we now have very young and inexperienced coaching staff. I don't even think that... Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Is Nuri Shahin, does he have a, a license to even coach, to, to be the head coach? Not entirely sure, but um, it is obviously because they are, of course, uh, two ex-players and two very prominent uh, and, and important uh, ex-players in Dortmund's more recent history. Um, it is obviously an interesting dynamic. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very intrigued to see what will come out of that. Matthias, uh, when you first heard that uh, Dortmund made this decision to hire both Bender and Shahin um, as their coaches, uh, what was your reaction? Because I do remember Lars saying on Twitter that he will try to be positive about it. <laughs> but that lasted like one friendly result. And then <laughs> uh, he laid it on thick. But, uh, you know, before we get into that, maybe um, your your reaction. I mean, one friendly. I mean, that's that's. I, I wouldn't put that at, at Shine and Benda's feet just yet. Um, no, they're absolutely so at fault. So, yeah. So, I mean, re reaction, I'm going to call bullshit on this being Tezic's idea because you may, I mean, you may be hiring your replacement and that's, nobody does that. Let's be perfectly honest. Uh, Nuri Shahin, um, who took over at Antalya Spoa when he was still a player, so he was player coach. Uh, kind of like Jürgen Klopp, Hullet. like Jürgen Klopp or Ruud <laughs> Uh Once upon a day, um, I think even Gianluca Vialli um, at at Chelsea. You've but, lost me there, but continue. <laughs> sorry, old old people, old people talk. Um, <laughs> but uh, Nuri Shine, what he did at Antalya Spor, who have like no money and always in debt, um, you know, 
not a great run club. He actually did well with them in two seasons, mid table. We you should know, probably which, mention that he not, what, wasn't only the coach there, but also sporting yeah. director. Also sporting. I mean, like he had to do everything. Yeah, play, you know, <laughs> coach. play, coach, find players. I mean, it was you want to talk about a baptism by fire, taking over a nearly bankrupt. A relegation facing Turkish club, and they're like, "Here, do it all. You can be the captain too." Um, and he he did. I mean, two seasons, uh, mid table. I think tenth and twelfth or thirteenth or something like that. Uh, they're still mid table right now. That I mean, I'll be honest. I don't I don't know about the quality of the football that he played, but who cares? I mean, that's like you want to talk about a fireman job. That's <laughs> That's, that's like drinking from the fire hose and trying to get it all done. So he has a lot of respect for me for doing that. I mean, that shows competency um, because someone who's not competent, you know, that, well, you know, that would be more like Gary Neville at Valencia uh, type levels of incompetency. So Nuri Shaheen is obviously competent. He could obviously do it. Um, his connection to the club and the fans... Uh, you know, we don't have to go into that. That's that's very obvious. He had there's a tr built in trust there from the brass, uh, which is important. Um, and I mean, he played with a couple of the guys in the locker room, uh, two very important players in the locker room in Marco Royce and Mats Hummels and, and Jane so, Sancho. <laughs> and Jaden Sancho. But but with Sancho, it was a little little shorter. No, I'm just um, I'm just I'm just kidding. Yeah. But. But obviously, Hummels and and Marco Royce, and then so, you know that that's really good with Sven Benda. I knew nothing about his coaching credentials until I read him. Like, oh, he actually did do some coaching at youth level. Um, now, to be basic, I I would say it's probably he's the assistant of the assistant. Um, you know, Nuri Shine will probably be more the more senior of the assistant coaches, given that he's actually done it at the professional level. Uh, in very difficult circumstances, but that's a sounding board, especially those were top, top professionals, whereas Eden Tezic wasn't, you know, um, he wasn't a player. He, he really, um, not, not at any level of German football that I'm at least aware of, um, in, in the first or second Bundesliga. So it, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't think I am, uh, but that, that gives him legitimacy with the team because I think that's the one area that has been reported quite often that there were breaks between Tezic and Kia and breaks starting to appear between Tezic and the team. And bringing in Kia and Shahin will automatically fix so much of that because they also played with Sebastian Kia. So there, there's a, a a core there. I think what, the reason why I'm calling bullshit on this was Tezic's idea is because this significantly helps Kiel more than Eden Tezic because these are kids buddies too. Um, and so I'm not going to say they hired Tezic's replacement, but if things continue to slide this month, and you know the the league is kicking off again this weekend oh boy um against Darmstadt oh away boy. away at Darmstadt well um, at least we can give <clears throat> Darmstadt the poison of their own <laughs> a yeah, taste of their own yeah. medicine because <laughs> well, Borussia, be Dortmund is Borussia Darmstadt as uh, one of the was, recent yeah. episode titles <laughs> well but the thing is if the slide continues here in January um before you get into the meat of the Champions League coming up again I, you know, I, I Dortmund can pull the plug on Tazic and just slide Shahin in there until the end of the season. And you at least have someone there that has a connection to everything and has coaching experience. He's got as much coaching experience as Aiden Tazic. Let's yeah, be honest. But is that good? I don't know. Um, well, I, it's hard to say because obviously it's apples and oranges comparison. Tazic won a cup. With Dortmund, so I mean, he's he's got more success technically, uh, and almost won the league, but you, you kind of have that stopgap because I believe there was a very serious conversation about replacing it in Tezic, and the conversation that ended up with, we're not going to why, because who are you going to replace him with? 
there's really nobody available that I believe will markedly improve Dortmund in a way that they want. All right. You can, Here's you can an get info people. you. Yeah. What, what about Antonio Conte? <laughs> He's not on the market. Okay. Again, that will significantly improve <laughs> Dortmund. Antonio Conte, as an Inter fan, obviously what he did as Inter was great. At Tottenham, we won't talk about it. Because that was a freaking train wreck. He would not come to Borussia Dortmund for many reasons. Language, money, and he would immediately start complaining about you need to spend 100 million euros in the transfer market. So, I mean, that's 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 a, a non-starter. There's really, like I said, there's nobody there that I think can improve the club significantly enough to warrant that type of upheaval. Um now, I mean, there are one or two names that are available, but at the end of the day, I looked at them and went, no, I just don't see a reason to make that cut for them. You bring in Nuri Shahin, you, you kind of have an, at least a stopgap solution that might work out uh, versus, and it'd be a lot cheaper than hiring a name coach and then having to let them go after the season or something like that, or even just hiring them for the season. So I, I think I, I think this could work out. Well, we'll, we'll see. Um, what is, of course, important uh, is Dortmund uh, press better and have a much better ball distri distribution because last season... I think one of the biggest ailments is their is their build up play and the lack of uh a structure and uh my favorite word automatism um to to really hound in on opponents and uh, I've read that um Dortmund when they changed tactics throughout the game um that it often was derived from the players on field rather than from Tessic himself which might be a leak that's not really confirmable, but uh, an interesting tidbit nonetheless that uh, an information like this uh, even surfaces because it, it rarely does. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like this is uh, one thing that has annoyed me this season, I'll be honest, quite a lot, that um, there are a lot of um, leaks and and reports from tabloids and and, and other uh, and, and newspapers um where you have a level of information or speculation that you usually do not have because i feel like there are more people at the club and maybe it's care who knows maybe it is that are feeding journalists and reporters um m with more information from behind the scenes and uh that was probably one of the main strengths, uh, especially in the club era, but also uh, long after that, that not much um, stuff that usually happens internally uh, made it to the surface. I think one good example right now is the uh, Paris Brunner situation. Um, because when he, uh, I think at uh, the training camp in Marbella, there was a um, day where he showed up late uh, <laughs> Or past the curfew, rather, and uh, reporters had that information instantly. I'm being a former Dortmund beat writer, can tell you that this is the sort of information that Dortmund usually used to keep more secret and not uh, slide over to reporters uh, right at the at the get go. Maybe. Maybe later on, maybe a week or so removed, delayed, you know, telling people that something had happened, but uh, basically airing out all the dirty laundry of a, I don't know, 17-year-old uh, uh, right away, which um, led to Bild, I think, writing a headline asking how stupid can you be. Um, I, I think it's, it's a new era of uh, um, how Dortmund and the, the press interact let's say so um that's that's just one thing that i've i i've realized um is currently not great um that there are too many parties chatting and and sort of uh i don't know trying trying to one up each other and uh, trying to win the pr battle and all this kind of nonsense this is something you're very much used to from bayern or from other clubs 
uh, but Dortmund uh, in recent years have actually managed to stay clear of that for the most part. Um, I think we just had the, and that that might just been made up by Bild, but uh, the report said that Royce wanted to uh, <laughs> uh, end Tessic's, uh job. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know what to make of this, but I'm just saying there there are many many stories written. Anyway, Matthias, um, back to the actuality. So obviously Dortmund will play Darmstadt this weekend. And uh, what I think is most exciting for most people is that Jane Sancho has returned from Manchester United. And uh, also very exciting for me personally is that Ian Martin uh, is joining Dortmund alone. As uh, we are recording this, it has not been confirmed yet, but he has already been in Dortmund. He has passed his medical as far as I know. And he's also already trained with the team. They just haven't made it uh, official yet, but uh, I assume by tomorrow at the latest we will have some sort of official confirmation. Um, but Matthias, let's talk about Jane Sancho first. Obviously, uh, you are a bit closer um, to the ongoings in the Premier League. So for people who have not paid too much attention to Jane Sancho's career in the Manchester United shirt maybe give a quick recap of why it hasn't worked out for him there and why he is now happy to be, quote, home. Eric Ten Hag is a prick. There. No. Uh, <laughs> that's wow, yeah, don't give any more context. Thank you. Goodbye. No, Good no, night. That's, that's... Thank you for listening. Exactly. Until next, no, that's, until next at week. least that would be Jaden Sancho's analysis. No, um, I mean, Jaden Sancho, like, God. I mean, you think about it, Kagawa, Mkhitaryan, Sancho, don't go from Dortmund to Manchester United. Um, it, it won't end well. The The issues at Manchester United, uh, initially, Jane Sancho's career there was okay. You know, it started off all right. Um, you know, he had some injury stuff and, and so on and so forth. And then Eric Ten Hag took over. Uh, and Ten Hag, I remember I talked to a, a very good friend of mine from the Netherlands, when Dortmund were looking for a coach, this was pre Marco Rosa and the post Lucien Favre. And, you know, I mentioned Ten Hag to him and he said, you don't want Ten Hag. You don't want him. So he's, mm -mm, don't, you don't want him at your club. And when you look at what's happening at Manchester United, you can kind of see why. I mean, he is uh, extraordinarily stubborn. He's uh, an extreme disciplinarian by all reports and all accounts that I read. And, um, you know, things are not good at Manchester United. And with Jaden Sancho was just one of those, one of a few who kind of fell into the negative spotlight of Ten Hag. Part of that was some of his performances weren't great. But we know that from Borussia Dortmund that Jaden Sancho is a kind of guy who can drop the shoulders and, you know, woe is me a bit but under the right tutelage, quickly regains his confidence. You know, he's well, a confidence that, player. He's also someone who might show up late for training. Or, yes, or... and he's been known that. I mean, he, he's got a poor disciplinary track record. Now, towards the end of Dalton, it was a little bit better. But, you know, the thing that shocked me when I saw the press release, say Jane Sanchez back, and they said he's 23, in my head, for some reason, I thought he was much older already. I don't know why, but the fact that he's still only 23 years old, um, I believe then he's younger than Donny Mahan. Um, and so, you know, he's he's a confidence player. He needs the right environment around him. He needs to feel like the coach is on his side, and Ten Hag just wasn't. And then Jaden Sancho did the one thing you can't do, and that is complain about the coach in public. And you definitely can't do it with Ten Hag. He has no acceptance for it. And I understand that. I wouldn't have any acceptance for it either, uh, especially when things are rocky. And then it just kind of escalated from there and nobody backed down. And that's why he's now at Borussia Dortmund in, in the hopes that he can kind of rebuild his confidence, rebuild his form, and uh, honestly outlast Eric Ten Hag at Manchester United. You know, I mean, that'll be the the interesting question in this entire saga. He, he'd like to play for England in the summer. I don't see that happening personally. Uh, also, because I have, I don't think very highly of Gareth Southgate. Um, he kind of overlooks. He's he's fond of overlooking good players that aren't at the core, 
in in England or okay Real Madrid. That we'll leave, leave that one there. Well, first of um, all, Jaden Sancho needs to perform, but well enough. He needs to perform. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's on him to perform well, and then everything comes after that. I think part of it is to rebuild his form, rebuild his career, and in an environment where he feels welcome and loved. I think that's very important. I mean, you saw that video when they asked, you know, where, where's his locker? He asked, where's Marcos? Like, he wanted to be next to Marco Reus. Uh, and that just shows him his, like, you could tell he's happy to be back. And I think that alone will help a little bit. Now, you can't have too many pouty attacking players, and Dortmund right now have a <laughs> few of them. And Jaden Sancho isn't going to make that any better. Um, and we had talked about this a few months ago, I believe even. And I said, I don't know if I would want him back because of exactly that. Um, now, at that time, other players were performing better and I didn't see the need. Now I can see a bit more of a need of a slightly more veteran don't want presence and add some depth because there are just injury issues there. You know, Adeyemi is injured and he's not playing well. Jamie Bynogetton's always battles injuries. Marco Royce, you can't bank on him being healthy. Uh, Daniel Mann is going through a mini slump, even though not as bad as he was uh, 12 months ago. Not even, I mean, much better than he was 12 months ago. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of, and attacking players I know can be a little bit... <sighs> diva-esque at times you know it's kind of like in the nfl wide receivers are your divas you, you know they're wingers they're these are your wide receivers in in uh soccer and so it's <sighs> great to have him back but he really really needs to improve and not undercut tazich he can't do what he did under ten hawk and at the end of the day, the issue with Ten Hawk was predominantly around discipline, less so around performance. Because a lot of times when Ten Hawk did play Sancho, he actually played well. But it was everything off the pitch, and that's incredibly important to Ten Hawk. And so, you know, that's that's the main crux. And he can't pull that stuff now because I don't think Dalton will have any patience for that now either, given how precarious their situation is. Well, I think the good news is that um, him and Eden Tessage, Eden Tessage, Jesus Christ, aren't strangers. And so I think um, Jaden Sancho definitely knows what to expect uh, from from uh, Tessage and vice versa. So um, I, kn I think they have found a way to um, handle these kind of things the last time, and uh, I think Jaden Sancho, even though he's only 23, is probably intelligent enough to know that this is a massive break for him to uh, reignite his career um, because, obviously, uh, it was not going great at Manchester United and uh, the fact that he hasn't really played now in, what, four months? Didn't even Did he train with the team? I think not, right? He was sort of training school with Spy. Yeah, he was excluded from all team activities. Yeah, so that is obviously a massive problem for a professional footballer, <laughs> I would say. So reintegration uh, for Jaden Sancho um, is going to be problematic. And obviously, um, I don't want to be too ranty, but the fact that uh, both these transfers took until the end of the very short training camp is far from ideal. And I hated <laughs> that we could not iron these out quicker and uh, yeah that is certainly a criticism I will put at the feet of Sebastian Kiel because he is squarely responsible for this obviously it takes two to tango and the other parties obviously are also involved but nevertheless um, it is in nobody's interest really because Chelsea and Manchester United as far as I know expect both these players back and uh, it would sure be helpful for those players to then also have a uh, easy as possible transition to Borussia Dortmund. Um, but that being said, um, Ian Martin, um, from his profile, um, obviously, <laughs> first thing you will notice, he's very short, and that already gives me a headache because the modern fullback does not only run forward but also has to tuck in to replace a center back. So if there will be a cross to a player that he has to cover into the box, which uh, a lot of Dortmund left-backs or full-backs in general st do struggle with, 
um, then I already have my concerns. But that being said, um, he is very similar to a certain Rafael Guerrero in his uh, player profile. And I think this is, uh, I hope, a very positive for Dortmund because they do need more connective tissue in that area of the field where, you know, Dortmund's build-up often goes through the full backs and then is often where where shit hits the fan, so to speak. So if you have someone that is able to dribble inside a little bit more, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that would be helpful. Um, now, obviously, I, I do hope that uh, he himself has a lot of healthy soft tissue because he will need it because as of right now, he is the only left back in the squad, really. And uh, I do not want to see Nico Schlotterbeck play left back at any point this season. So not quite sure, um, Matthias, if you have seen him actually play. I personally have not. Um, but um, it is nice at least to have someone in that position who has been trained to play that position because... With Ben Sabaini being at the AFCON, this is very important for Dortmund um, to to have him there. And I do hope that he already starts against Darmstadt on Saturday. I don't know when does this game start. Saturday, yeah. All right. Um, I know I haven't seen Ian Matson uh, much. I, th- I may have seen him on a loan deal lower down in the championship or something like that, but not not really one that I noticed. I mean, if you look at Transfermarkt. And you look at rumors, three, um, you know, in the top 10 rumors are all left backs for Borussia Dortmund between Ian Matson, uh, Fran Garcia and, and Sergio uh, Regalon. Uh, now, the Regalon deal is trending down, and I think that's pretty much not going to happen. Fran Garcia is trending up uh, and, you know, you never know. Could be. And and I wouldn't be opposed to having two players, even if two players on loan, because the risk then for the club is lower and you can possibly add one of them permanently if they perform without the pressure. Um, you know, the advantage of the Ben Sabaini deal was that it was just, you know, I mean, there was no transfer fee. So it's not like a Nico Schulz type deal where there was a lot of money attached to it. It's wages. His wages are manageable right um, but I, you have to factor in a lot of prize money like champions yes. qualification so because of course, you have a left back and don't get good results yes but i'm i'm just saying like the risk for dortmund is relatively low if they go down this route because they're not losing a ton of money either way um so it, it, i i i like this deal for matson i don't know too much about him i know he's more creative creativity was never an issue for me with Guerrero, it was the fact that he wasn't a good defender and that bit Dortmund time and time again. And he had no hustle, none whatsoever. And that's that's a big issue. You, If you're going to be that creative outlet and be attacking, you got to hustle back and not hope that Nico Schlotterbeck saves you because Nico Schlotterbeck will make a mistake, undoubtedly. Um, so <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't mind Ian Madsen and Fran Garcia coming to Dortmund at least for the second half of the season to shore that up a little bit because what was the the thing I read briefly today that, you know, if they don't get the right coverage given injuries with Riasson and the African cup of nations, you know, you're going to have Thomas Mounier on the right and Nico Schlotterbeck on the left back position uh, simply because you kind of have to uh, due to lack of options. Now I'll be honest. I, may then prefer to see Nico Schlotterbeck centrally, but the problem is you don't have another left back. So you kind of have to put someone at left back and then you can't put Zula at right back because you need him in the middle. So it's uh, a bit of a shuffle right now you know, with injuries. Well, uh, I mean, I, I did joke that uh, it was a bold uh, strategy of Nuri Schein as his first move as a manager slash sporting director. Uh, to hire Jane Sancho as a left back. But if we, you know, are forced to play him as a left wing back <laughs> because you have to switch to a back three, I would not be surprised <laughs> at this point, if I if I may say so. Because yeah, there's no knows? talking Hazard a- around, so no. who are you gonna who are you gonna plug in there? That also has any kind of footballing quality, which is, you know, also important. So yeah. 
really really intrigued to uh to find out how this thing will work because Ian Martin I'm pretty sure um even though he's just 21 years old um will also need to have a break here and there I don't foresee that he will play um the next 15 games from minute 1 to minute 90 uh <laughs> without any any problems especially having uh, Dortmund's track record of fullbacks getting injured um because i mean it is a very uh taxing position as is so it's it's not surprising these guys pick up muscular injuries left right and center and other fatigue related injuries and of course in Riasson's case it's uh, extra annoying that he is out for a very long time because he picked up an injury in, I don't know if it was a loss or a draw, but uh, sort of a, uh, a play that was completely irrelevant, ball going out at the sideline with like 10 seconds on the clock or something. So, yeah, very, very vexing for, for Dortmund to not have Riasson because I would even say going into the season um, or, or, or going into this half season, let's say, um, he is probably our best left back, um, even with everyone else healthy. And uh, I'm just gonna say it now. I do think that Thomas Meunier is actually a, a somewhat competent uh, right back, and I think can help Dortmund out quite a bit. So um, yes, agree. there has been a lot of Thomas Meunier hate in the past, but I feel like that's related to him a being not Hakimi and b not being Pischek, and Dortmund having world class talent on that position and he is not a world class talent that is for sure but uh, he is also not as bad as uh, Ben Zbaini I would say um he there is some international class in there but uh, yeah obviously we know a lot of uh, Munier cockups too but um I think him now regaining some form and fitness um will help Dortmund out uh, quite a lot actually and um yeah I'm also going to be intrigued to see how the whole having the three center backs available um, will play out in the second half of the season. Um, given there will be fewer games because Dortmund have managed to uh, uh, focus more on the league and Champions League without uh, any cup football. And uh, yeah, I'm also intrigued to find out if Dortmund actually make it past PSV in the uh, round of 16 in the Champions League given their their current state and where focus might uh, be on. But um, yeah, interesting interesting uh, times at Dortmund and I do wonder because right now I think Dortmund fans are all surfing a wave of good vibes with Jane Sancho coming back because uh, I think for many this is a, a, a very positive thing I wonder if this all falls apart <laughs> as soon as Darmstadt which uh, in my mind is a very very important game for Dortmund because they need those three points you already uh, managed to not beat Mainz, who are also, I don't know if they were in last place or second to last. Um, but yeah, this is uh, for Dortmund now very important uh, to uh, get those three points because there is literally no room for error anymore. And uh, the next two games are against Darmstadt and then away to Cologne, who are 18th and 17th. So the... Uh, Next four games are all teams that are on paper relegation candidates. I know Heidenheim are in ninth place right now and are playing a decent season, but uh, given their budget, I, I would uh, add them in too. And of course, VfL Bochum will always a team be a team that struggles in the Bundesliga, just given their resources. So um, I think Sebastian Kehl is on record saying that January will be Dortmund's month. They have three games in that month and uh, they need to win all three. And I would go as far as say they will need to win the next four games. Um, whether they actually be able to pull it off, I'm not quite sure. But that is certainly my expectation um, going into this stretch because Dortmund just needs those 12 points um, direly. Um, Matthias, I don't know if you want to give any more detailed preview on uh, Darmstadt since this is your favorite team and club. Um, but I think it is fair to say that they have altered their playing style a little bit. Um, it's not it's it's not Dirk Schuster's yes. Darmstadt. Because I was in Dortmund 
when Dortmund lost to Dirk Schuster's Darmstadt. No, I, th- I think um, that was a that was a draw uh, or a draw. Yeah, yeah sorry, it felt, it like, felt a like a loss. Yes. Felt like a loss. Was, they yeah. lost in Darmstadt though. G- exactly. You no, know, exactly. <laughs> um, no, I expect them to win. They have to win. Anything other than three points is a failure. Uh, it's last team. Uh, Darmstadt are not good. Uh, if Dortmund have any aspiration to not completely suck, this is a must win. Now, it is a Saturday night game in Darmstadt. It's cold in Germany this weekend. It's winter. That's the kind of weather and situation that tends to favor teams like Darmstadt over teams like Dortmund. Um so it's not going to obviously there's no such thing as an easy Bundesliga match. Uh it's going to be overtly physical is my is my expectation and it'll be a question on how Dortmund react to said overt physicality. But I expect a win and anything less and man the pitchforks are going to be out for Tezic right away. I mean it's like if they're if they're not and it's not just about winning. You need to win well. Well, you know? here's my prediction. Even if Dortmund win this game, there's no way they're going to win well. There's just no way they're going to be playing well enough all well, of the, the problem, sudden. Again, the situation isn't speaking in their favor. And we're going. I'm going back on like 30 years of Dortmund history here. You know, a winter away match against an uncomfortable side under the floodlights. Dortmund never does well in a situation like that. I don't care if it's... If the coach is Klopp, Hitzfeld, or Terzic, you know, it just, it's always been a struggle for no, Dortmund. I think there was that. the odd cup game against so, like Holstein Kiel or so, fine. where the well, pitch yes, was entirely okay. frozen. They won Fair easily. Enough. I'll three give nothing. you that one. I'll give you that one. But this isn't that. So, and, well, it and could it's be. a different confidence <laughs> situation. It's a different confidence situation. But again, Darmstadt also are not in a good situation. So, yeah, you have to win it. I mean, at the end of the day, Stefan. I'll be honest, as long as Dortmund come away with three points, I will be happy, but I'd like them to play well. I, um, just, I just went on FB Ref um, to see if Darmstadt are leading the league in, in long passes, and they do lead the league in attempted long passes, which are passes longer than 30 yards, um, but <laughs> Dortmund are leading the league <laughs> in completed long passes, which is also not great. Um, and, and that goes back to a rant I had about a month ago. Yes, uh, because uh, in attempted long passes, Dortmund are, uh, I think, sixth right now, or seventh. They have... Uh, uh, they they have uh, only played two fewer or attempted two fewer long balls than Mainz. Uh, no, s- excuse me, uh, than than Bremen. No, I'm I'm once again one row below. Um, but uh, yeah, it is it it is it is atrocious. Um, Dortmund have attempted uh, 1,264 long passes and completed 809 of those, um, which uh, is is good in terms of completion rate. Um, but uh, it's funny that Leverkusen and Bayern both have a higher long passes completion rate, uh, while uh, Bayern and Leverkusen are both the teams with the fewest attempted long passes. And uh, that, I think, describes quite well the gulf in footballing quality and tactical acumen of, of these two I, teams compared I, to Dortmund. I will, I will lean on the latter more than the former. I mean, I, I, I know I see a lot of this is, you know, people saying this is just a really bad team. It's not. I reject that wholeheartedly and completely. And and I'm pissed off again now. So you did achieve that. But uh, for me, that's that's tactical acumen 101. It's it's a it's a coach with a limited um, bag of tricks. And it is a situation of desperation. I'm too scared to lose. So we're just going to try to not do that. And um, that's that's what that says. And this Dortmund team and these players are not built for the long ball. You know, I mean, if anything, Tezic would then then go to one of those teams. Um, Dortmund aren't built for that. These players aren't. That's not their mindset. That's not how they thrive and play better. But um, on this question, though, do you think you can play a very good ball circulation style with a lot of short passes when you have Emre Can and, and Zabitzo or Can and Ershan 
or whoever in midfield because I think there are some caveats to that if if I entirely honest because I think the players currently in Dortmund's heart the the engine room whatever you want to call it do not quite have the footballing quality to entirely pull this off um I I do believe that there is a, a certain lack of footballing quality but that being said I still do agree with your opinion that you should be able to play the style in a more successful way than Dortmund are currently executing it. Well, I think one of the main things you would have to do is you pull a creative player into that engine room, and the fact that Tezic doesn't do it drives me up the freaking wall. Well, it's funny. When I play FIFA right now uh, with Dortmund, I have a 4-1-4-1 system, and I have a double eight with Reus and Brandt basically in front of yes. a lone holding midfielder. Yes, yes. And the thing is with Zabitza, I've seen him do it at Leipzig. I've seen him do it. He is more than capable of playing that type of football. You know, Zali Ochan, that's not his role. He's a ball recycler. And that's okay. You do need that. Um, and Emre Can, when he's not trying to do everything at the same time, he can move the ball well. Uh, at pace and with technique he's done it he he he's proven to do it but if you but to be able to do that you do need to pull a brand or a reina or a royce into that heart to be able to do that well the good and news if, is that all three players you just mentioned are more than capable of doing that royce is a strategist yes. brand certainly is and Gio reina Hundred percent confidence yes. in him playing the number eight role, if he was trusted yes. with it. And there I you do, go. I do wonder um, if the addition of Nuri Shine helps Emre Can because I do think not just because of their Turkish roots, um, but I do think they are somewhat on the same wavelength because they they are similar in the position they play and similar in. I don't want to say character, but uh, you you know where I'm getting at. Um, I I do I do believe that. Um, um, they, I I know for a fact that they have talked about each other in such positive light often enough that I believe that they have a, a sympathy uh, and admiration for each other, and I think this is always a a good basis for a work relationship. I agree. Nuri Shahin can teach um, Emre Can a little bit more about patience and control, and Emre Can can teach Nuri Shahin how to kick a penalty. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um but you you hit you hit the nail on the head perfectly when he's when you said if he will be trusted enough with Giorena. That is the thing. The coach isn't doing it. He's not pl- putting the players in a position to succeed and play the style of football that Dortmund play. And if he keeps on putting those players, Royce, Reina, if he ever plays Reina, uh, even though I have my question marks with Gio Reyna or uh, Julian Brandt far up the pitch, but they never get the ball. And the only way you think you can get the ball to them is by hoofing it to them, even though that is not how those players thrive. Um, that you have what we have right now. Pull one or two of those players into that central midfield in a 4-1-4-1 system like you talked about, Mr. FIFA. Um <laughs> And one, you will have stability because I think if you put John or uh, Ushan as that six role, you have stability. They can do that role and they can do it well. Uh, And you can circulate and recycle the ball and possession properly with some pressing resistance. Because Royce and Brandt have great pressing resistance. That's the other thing. They don't lose the ball quickly and easily, and they don't lose it in bad positions most of the time. Well, in form Brandt, Um, you know, this season's version has often lost the ball in very precarious situations. Yes, but he's still very good. He's still better than he was three years ago. Um and that's the key thing. I want to see this match, and I want to see a creative player in that central midfield. And if I don't, then I've seen everything I need to know. Yes. Period. That, that's where I'm entirely with you. And in the case of Gio Reyna, I think it's very interesting that he now has switched agency, right? Um, And I think 
it's not that hard to read the tea leaves that he probably wants to leave Borussia Dortmund sooner rather than later because the playing time he's receiving right now is doing nothing for his career. And that is very unfortunate. Obviously, there are a lot of factors why Gio Rainer so far has not made the um, complete breakthrough. One of those named Julian Brandt and Marco Reus, I would say, because they play in his position. And just because of the roles they have respectively in the club, it is very hard to compete against those. Um, another major building block of uh, him not really making it so far is obviously his injuries. Um, and uh, maybe you would even add petulance knowing <laughs> how you see Giorena. But that being said, we all know what Giorena is capable of and uh, it would be very annoying for Dortmund to miss out on the prime Gio Reyna if uh, that is a possibility to have because I do believe um, he is sort of the perfect successor for Marco Reus and to take over that role um, in, in a year or so but obviously football is moving way faster and Gio Reyna is not going to be patient enough um, to, to do that but uh, to me that is uh, already sort of a missed opportunity because I feel like um, he's going to be working very hard on a transfer and if Dortmund don't afford a more playing time now, I don't think there will be uh, uh, any remedy for the Black and Yellows to to convince him to stay on later and maybe Dortmund get a nice transfer fee for him. I don't know, but uh, right now I'm ruining a little bit the 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 chances missed with Gio Reyna in, in the team because I know he is a very capable player and uh, he is uh, a bit of unfulfilled potential yet. So my hope is that some somehow he manages to um, implement that a little bit more this season. But uh, yeah, we'll, I'll also be intrigued how the... Uh, Squad selection will be now under Nuri Shahin as the assistant manager together with Eden Terzic because uh, I will be damn sure that uh, both Shahin and Bender will have a palpable influence even if we, if it will be hard to or harder to tell. Um, but I'm, I'm sure there will be a visible difference uh, in like two, three months of what Dortmund is now. At least that is my hope because... If there isn't, then all hope is fairly lost and then maybe we need to give Quante a call after all or some, someone else entirely. Fair enough. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that those are my two cents on, on Gio Reyna. This is sort of a do or die situation. I think more for Dortmund than for Reyna because I think Gio Reyna will be fine as a footballer going forward when he maybe goes to a different team in a different league or, or wherever um, but uh, yeah I, I really hope that Dortmund can uh, make the most out of his potential at least in the time of him still being here and uh, then then we'll see how, how things continue but uh, I think for now um, that wraps it up quite nicely um, um, it was definitely an interesting discussion and I can't well Actually, I, I wouldn't mind if the season restarts in like a, a week or so just for my own mental health, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's time to wrap it up. So, Matthias, uh, if you have any last thoughts, uh, be my guest. Uh, well, to quote a good friend of mine, don't screw it up. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's what I got for, for Dortmund here. You better win the next three Bundesliga matches. That's all I'm saying. Oh. Otherwise, it's going to get really incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we just uh, had a lot of old people talk. Uh, that reminds me, Matthias, uh, you have any words on uh, Franz Beckenbauer passing? Because I feel like this is uh, significant yeah. enough to, uh, to at least mention. Well, if you think about it, um, within I, th I believe within the last six months, you know, the footballing world has lost Bobby Charlton, Mario Zagallo, and Franz Beckenbauer, and those are three uh, transformative players, uh, and two of them transformative coaches as well. With Beckenbauer, I know he was from Bayern, um, but I mean, born and bred Münchner, even though he grew up an 1860 fan, and the famous. 
getting a getting a slap on a playground basically <laughs> made him a Bayon fan, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, for me, inarguably the greatest German footballer of all time, um, respected worldwide. And that to me always says a lot when your opponents, you think about Italy in the seventies, England in the sixties and early seventies respected him immensely. Uh, he was, you know, he, he won a world cup, uh, as a player, he won it as a team chef, as a coach, he didn't have the licenses. And ironically, at the same time, he was the coach for Olympic Marseille. So he was being a German national team coach and a club coach, which was just interesting at that time. Um, you know, he, he definitely was one of the key members of making Bayern who they were, even though, off the pitch, most of that credit has to go to Uli Hoeneß. Um, and yeah, it, it's a it's a sad loss for world football, but specifically for German football, uh, because yeah, he was he was the greatest of all the German footballers. Yeah, very nice words. Thank you, Matthias. And uh, everyone out there will be back next week to discuss the heroics of Dortmund in Darmstadt. Until then, thank you for listening. Goodbye.